today, but very happy to be in Canada for the outcome of a sport that I really don't care that much about. But uh, we're here to talk about other things. We're here to talk about uh, you know what what we do and, and some of uh, why we do it. Um, I, I really do care a lot about our clients and our work and and what we're bringing the power to our of our agency uh, to help resolve. Uh, we believe a lot in sharing our knowledge in events like this. So we'll travel um, around to help build community, uh, which in the case of uh, the ultimate uh, demise, is anyone still working on any Drupal 6 websites? One? Okay. So still a couple life support uh, uh, um, items, but um, uh, for the official uh, uh, death of Drupal 6, the um, end of life, we threw a funeral in New Orleans, a jazz style funeral with a second line band. Uh, and Dries was there, we gave talks, there were hundreds of people, it was amazing, it was beautiful. Uh, and it was, it was a great thing. We worked on Drupal 6 a really long time. It's good to send it off. Um, we're also really interested in engaging in conference settings, raising awareness around uh, social causes, um, having frameworks for donations, either to various uh, charities, or uh, in this case, we um, helped to plant about 450 trees in Northern California to repopulate some of the devastating wildfires there. Uh, this was at DrupalCon this year. But enough about us. Uh, we're here to talk about this project uh, and this client. Uh, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco is the, well, there are two different institutions. One is the Legion of Honor, which is a three-quarter size replica of the Legion of Honor in Paris. It's kind of, it's cool. Uh, and, except they don't have like the dead people buried underneath. And uh, the de Young is like the, the, the AGO of San Francisco. There's, together, they're, they're some of the, it's like one of the largest art institutions in, uh, in the United States. And uh, this year, next year, they will be 125 years old. And uh, so our project um, was about moving beyond the frame, beyond kind of the, the static, oh, yeah, the static, we're making static sites, but still the art is static on the wall. Uh, but what happens if you, you're not there to see the exhibition? How do you get enticed to come? What if you can't visit? What if there's more that you want to know about the, the history of the exhibition? So the, the museum had already engaged in creating these forms of educational digital experiences, um, and they had an existing Drupal 8 website that was built using paragraphs. How many of you have used paragraphs before? Um, it takes a while to create a paragraph, right? Like, you gotta put all the nuts and bolts. And what they found was they wanted to make some changes. They wanted to innovate on the front end. But it's kind of, they had all these new design paradigms, they wanted flair, they wanted all these other things, and they had an existing system. It was a challenge to like, figure out how to, how to do all this stuff, and we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, what did we do, ultimately? Um, this, this is our, our client uh, um, that, that's reporting back on, on the success of this project, and we'll, we'll dig in a little bit more deeply. Um, but highlights are that we, we built a robust toolkit and a content workflow, and we also proposed and they adopted new technologies that ultimately they would not have uh, considered on their own. And this is a form of true partnership when we can try to bring our heads together to solve a problem differently, and I'm pleased to share um, how we got there with you today. Hopefully it will be um, inspiring or um, at the very least uh, concerning. Um, so first, where did we start? Uh, we, we inherited a bunch of design deliverables. By the time we got onto the scene, and, and just for some background, uh, someone pressed the button for me, right? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, someone, uh, thank you. Uh, so we, we kind of came in and they had already selected a design partner to do, um, to do like all this pizzazz. Uh, they're called Upper Quad. We'll see some of their deliverables in a second. Uh, and we tried to kind of get in, but the process was sort of underway. So we ended up inheriting a bunch of work and uh, the, cl the client uh, management on the design side ha was very thorough and it was we weren't involved early enough to build a coherent uh, project management practice across all the agencies. So uh, these are some of the examples of the deliverables that they produced. Uh, this is one page of the, a style guide. I think it's about 60 or 70 pages 
It's like a PDF. And they have some examples of applications of how some of these components might work. This is a quote. And some design rules around it, they explain in bullet points how they should behave. They also delivered uh, to us eventually, after some prodding, uh, the sketch files that they used to generate all of the different components. Um, I didn't have the fonts when I opened this, so it looks a little weird if you are zooming. And they also produced an online style guide, which was interactive. That was the first thing that we saw. And it was concerning to us because uh, they were like screenshots of things and assets, and they were all just images. We couldn't, and there was a lot of text and explanation of these things. We couldn't annotate, highlight them, and they produced multiple versions of these. And there's like all these embedded videos that show all the motion. So we were, we were trying to deconstruct this process. Uh, the tools that they used were not web-centric. Is anyone like familiar with Flash and like Macromedia products and all these like timeline things? So they use this tool that lets them be really creative around how they're going to build transitions and move things around and they don't connect to any real world web libraries or, um, or paradigms of the web. So this whole design process and sign off was a, a, in some ways informed. They did have some web experience, but not, not as much depth as, as we do. And so the rubber was not in some cases able to quite meet the road. And um, in, that abs in that vacuum, um, yes, you know, beautiful pieces of design, wonderfully self-contained, issues with responsiveness, like how can we make some of these transitions work? Um, Here's a little uh, video of the interactions that they had designed uh, that will give you a little bit of, of an idea um, of, of these, cha these challenges. So here you know, some ways that the image behind the text is coming in and moving. Uh, here, the, this kind of fade across letters is like not really that typical of a web kind of thing that you can do. Like it's, it's really hard and you have to calculate every letter and they've got gradients halfway through. Um, some neat stuff, this works really well, but you really need the right video in the background to make that kind of uh, thing work. These, these things, cool, very custom, everything very custom. <laughs> Zoomy things. Um, you can see the navigation over here on the right. Uh, a lot of really beautiful nuance, and this, this was a, a design agency that was really their forte is in storytelling, in digital storytelling. And they, they referred to these assets and these experiences as digital stories, which as part of this process was rebranded as insights um, instead of digital stories. So um, this is a, a, a little bit of a view on, on what we were starting from. and. Um, very, very robust. They had redesigned some existing exhibitions and uh, had also focused on uh, one upcoming exhibition. So the, the content is then, you, you know, you can dive deeper. They have these kind of like hot spots that you can click on to get more stuff. All this, all this with them. So it was really exciting to us, you know, because like we, we knew that the outcomes would be, um, you know, a huge challenge for us and, and we would be making a beautiful product. Um, so again, like lots of stuff, lots of documentation, some questionable portability, um, very ambitious design, and ultimately a really tight timeline to deliver uh, this uh, this in. So uh, and they they came to us with also a really tiny budget because they were like, it's done, just make it happen, right? You know, <laughs> wave your magic wands, wizards of the web. And they knew that we had Drupal 8 expertise, and they had an existing Drupal 8 website. So how did we go about this? We are like, oh my goodness, there's like a huge design system in here. Um, and the design agency had itemized all of these different components and given them names. And there, so we started to create an, in, we made an inventory. We looked at what was existing and what would be changing and what was new. Uh, and they had, uh, so we identified all of the, their components, and we found those components where the data model was close enough to uh, be able to merge some of the 
components into single components with variations. And there were additional components that we needed to add, they hadn't planned for, um, that we were going to need to estimate and uh, design. Um, if you've used uh, paragraphs before, you know, you know and you have all these different things, some, some of them need to be contained, right? You can't just have uh, complex elements floating around, you have to, you have to bind, bind them. So we have these notion of containers. In the case of this expression, they were ex referenced as chapters, which also would be impactful on how the navigation was going if you saw those little timelines along the side. So we took all the components, and then we uh, estimated how much it would take for us to build just the front end expression of those, and then on the back end, how much effort it would take us to be building those in, in Drupal, and then a total, which was a combination of both of those. Uh, and then we worked through uh, phasing the approach and thinking about what we might be able to launch uh, progressively. Not all the components they had designed were targeted for the initial launch of the first digital story on the new platform, or uh, the new Insights platform that they were looking to do. So we, would, we were like, well, we don't need to launch with those. Let's just focus on what we need for phase one. So we identify all of these, all, identified all the components in phase one, and uh, we asked the client as well to attribute business value to the components, which ones were most important to them, so we could help to prioritize and understand the value of our effort against the benefit to the organization. Uh, and then we did a little pivot on uh, all of the different phases and figured out what all the estimates were for the different pieces. And uh, then what we did was we said, look, let's, um, let's not do any Drupal in phase one. Let's build a prototype and then we'll deal with the Drupal stuff afterwards. Um, we'll dive a little bit deeper into how we're able to do that. Uh, but that let us chunk things into reallocate the effort from the phase one component back end work into phase two and we got some total estimates for all the things and, and phase three was a, a, a series of features that we're talking uh, that we, we did implement post launch. And so this is what it looked like. We had four sprints to launch and then four sprints to build the back end. Um, the sprints are, were two weeks long. Uh, and throughout the summer, uh, vacations and uh, other things were occurring. So um, this is another important reason why we needed to think about decoupling our efforts in order to get the, um, the product out more quickly. And along the way, there were like so many moving parts and things were moving so quickly and we had all the JIRA and the issues and everything. It was hard for the product owners on the client side to know where we were at. So we made another little uh, spreadsheet for them about you know, where we're at, where we're blocked, what percentage along we are, because it was like everything is being worked on at the same time, right? And everyone's just hoping it's all gonna get done. Whereas um, you know, we, wanna, we wanna be able to uh, more clearly identify uh, what's what's going on? So this was this was quite quite helpful. A uh, bit of extra work. So the first thing we did was um, we went about building a prototype. And what is a prototype, and and how did we do that? So we have uh, concocted a tool called Calistatic, which we've been working on for about three and a half or four years. At the time that we de started developing it, Pattern Lab was just in in one point and uh, it didn't do a lot of things that we wanted it to do, uh, which is why we rolled our own. Um, it, provide, it didn't allow us to provide, produce any actionable like prototypes. Sure, you could put some things together, but you, you can't just kind of get code at the end of it that you can really use. We wanted our prototype code to be production ready, to have full control over the front end, and we wanted as well to be able to share all of our templates that were in the prototype with Drupal. At the time we started developing this, it was in Drupal 7, and we were interested. We knew that there was a Drupal 8 future, maybe, <laughs> right? Like, I don't know if you guys were, at the beginning it was like, what's going on? Is Drupal gonna implode? Is this 8 thing really gonna work? We started, we wanted to hedge our bets a little bit, and so we focused more on the front end. And so for those clients that were trepidatious about moving to Drupal 8, we could build out the front end. Hopefully Drupal 8 was gonna catch up. We would be most of the way there. And we wrote a small module called Twig Shim, which lets us use Twig natively in, in Drupal 7. And Drupal 8, um, we're using Twig using, uh, with uh, some other components, uh, the components module. 
Uh, but what Calistatic does is it provides a framework for websites and web apps. It allows us to produce a style guide, which is component driven, and to assemble those components into a series of pages to create layouts. Those layouts produce production ready code, and um, ultimately it helps us have some more coherent conversations between development and design where we're looking at code and talking more realistically about what's going to take place. Previously, we would have um, you know, a bunch of design work that would happen, it would be fantastic, and then the developers would pick it up and they would be in the situation that we were in on this project, which is, great, how do we make this happen? Um, so by working natively in the browser, we could have a lot of those, um, a lot of those conversations earlier. So in this first phase, as we were producing the prototype, uh, we used Markdown in order to maintain the content. We knew what all the content was gonna be, it had been authored, it was delivered upon us. They didn't really need a CMS in order to go in and keep at it because they had their own like Word docs and whatever. We we're gonna do a one-time port and then some tweaks. And we were there. It's like they, they didn't need that complete independence because we were continuing to build the project. So um, their uh, team was also comfortable uh, editing Markdown, and they were able to go in and do some, some edits, and we structured things. And, and you can start to see the structure a little bit. You know, you've got these, these headings, and the headings create these chapters. Um, there's some YAML front matter that uh, gets used, determines which layout we're being, is being used, uh, which template is being used for each section. Uh, you can see the, the twig name spacing that's coming up here and some properties that are gonna get passed into the templates. Uh, so we built this thing, and then, um, then we put it live, because it was good to go. Once it was live, we continued to iterate, and uh, we were developing phase two features, and talking about the CMS, at the, t the CMS, and introducing new features uh, iteratively in the, um, the static, static site model. Good so far. Any any questions about that first part? Yeah. Um, how many uh, developers were were working on this like day to day? Day to day. Um, one. So the client had uh, one developer that was uh, very that was very active, and we were working with um, and integrating into our our team. Though we were doing the work, they were getting educated along the way to be able to to get the handoff. On our side, we had a lead architect and uh, two other developers, uh, project manager, uh, account manager. Uh, we also had a, uh, a visual designer who knew uh, code and has contributed to building the, the Calistatic um, uh, as well. Um, it wasn't full time, they had some other projects, but at certain points it was like the majority of the majority of the with the uh, estimation, did you do it by points or hours? Or? Good question. Um, so we, we kind of did, uh, we did hours. Um, gone back and forth on that. The, the reality is budgets are like in hours and you don't really know how much a point is gonna cost until like the project's done. So it's very difficult from a client management perspective to do estimation in, um, in points, unless you have a long project life. It takes three sprints to be able to report back on velocity. We had four sprints, and uh, it was hard to track uh, expectations to reality. But most of our estimation is done in hours. We track our time in hours, and uh, all of our reporting aligns uh, more, more fluidly with that. Uh, so, we really suspected along the way that we were not going to be using Drupal, even though they came to us for that. We started to float the idea kind of early on. Um, we knew that they were dissatisfied with some with the architecture. We looked more deeply into it. You know, what could we recycle? What could we not recycle? There were a bunch of paragraphs in there, and and it wasn't you know a terrible site. It was pretty lightweight, uh, but. It just felt wrong to be replicating the same problems they were facing by making an, another version. Like, they wanted to innovate on the front end, and Drupal was getting in the way. So, like, why would we put another repeat experience of that? Drupal has been a bit slow to innovate on the front end. Um, 
it's a lot better in, in eight at the time that we were doing this. Things were still up in the air. But uh, you know, you're relying on all kinds of third-party modules to integrate libraries and do all kinds of other stuff. And there's a lot of fancy stuff that you can do. But we wanted a little bit more control. We wanted to be able to you know, compress, just throw whatever JavaScript we needed. And for a project like this, with all these different interactions, like we're going to really need to get very scripty and then you know, manage it, compress it, and, uh, and deliver it. So we thought, well, if we can level them up and give them a system where they're really, really focused on just the front end, then they may be much, much better off. And uh, the weight of paragraphs is a bit imposing. Um, just creating them, figuring out you know, how to name all of them. We want to use the right tool for the job. So what we did is um, we made a little bit of a proof of concept in a few different platforms, which we presented to the client. And we estimated and built a grid of a feature, a feature grid of, of different solutions that we thought would be, we thought would be possible. Uh, we, the content was in Markdown, so they could um, you know, continue along that route, or we could put a lightweight solution like prose.io, which is a Markdown editor that connects to your GitHub. It was built, the second version of it was built as part of the healthcare.gov uh, redo, and it gives you a little like, kind of visual WYSIWYG on your Markdown. You can flip back and forth, and it hides the YAML front matter, so you're really just focused on the content authoring but they would be giving their content authors access to the full repo. And they could browse around and edit kind of any file, not just the ones that were specified. So that was very risky, but a very, very low level of effort, all the way up to the highest level of effort, the extra large t-shirt size, uh, which is Drupal. Uh, Prismic, Kentico Cloud, Netlify had a CMS, Contenta CMS, and we let them, we made accounts and they could go in and play around with the user experience and how they were gonna own that and be able to control uh, the storytelling and the, the writing and the, the reordering of all these components. Uh, that was a really, really big thing for them. The way that the paragraphs were set up, and we've since been able to solve this, but for complex layouts where you have nested paragraphs, a paragraph within a paragraph, for a good while like you couldn't move it out of that space. You were kind of jammed in, which made it hard to like orchestrate these, this storytelling. At the end of the day, uh, the client decided they liked the user interface of gather content uh, the most, as well as the content authoring experience. And uh, we left the choice of the CMS up to the client uh, 100%. So what is this, how does this whole thing work? Um, all the code is in GitHub, and we're using Netlify. Netlify uh, has a build system that's also where we're hosting the production version of the website as well as all the other environments that are created from every pull request. And any edit on the GitHub, in the GitHub repo, any new code triggers a Netlify build, which then deploys out to the environment. Gather content is integrated as well through webhooks and also triggers a Netlify build. So um, we'll look a little bit more into gather content later, but it provides these different publishing states uh, that you can customize. These are the ones that we chose for this project. Live, uh, approval, uh, legal. Sometimes legal needs to approve something. Most of the stuff it bypasses it. And, uh, and publishing. So as content is moved through those different states, um, it builds out and is deployed. So they're editing the content, they can see it, they can see it build out. So what is, what is gather content? How many people have used gather content before? Explored gather content. Curious about gather content. Okay. Um, so gather content it was devised as a means of gathering your content, right? You're, you're pulling it all together, you wanna to work on it. We were very interested in this because what would often happen is, you know, you build out this content management system, you build all this stuff out, and then the content gets jammed in afterwards, and you're filling in boxes. We're building a CMS, right? C is the first word in CMS. Content comes first. There's no reason why you can't validate your data models early 
and start to explore whether or not the rubber's meeting the roads, whether you need that extra sub, sub, subheading field that they've identified in a spreadsheet you're going to need to build in Drupal, whether or not the list of options uh, is really, it's just really three options. Do you need a select here? Do you need, oh, how are your data models really going to need to be built? So gather content lets you build, like in Drupal, these sorts of forms where you can put fields and help text and people can fill things out and you have workflow management, you can add images and resource assets. And it has an API that you can query in order to get that content back out. Uh, its for strength is in content governance and in managing the creation of, of content. It can be used as well to deploy to multiple targets. But it was not designed to do what we did with it. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we did it. So here's what like one piece of content looks like on Gather Content. Uh, we provided these little tabs. They could upload an image. There's the alt text and uh, credits or caption. Uh, and then there, this is for the hero, which is kind of like that opening splash page thing. And then there's a little checkbox. If you maybe don't want to use an image, use a video. Um, there's a video and you could upload a, a cover image, other variables, and then some color options, some, some vari variations. And each of the components is built in this way. You create templates. Here are some of them that we used um, that maps to the original project plan and, and all of the components that we had uh, designed as part of this process. A column, a cover page, a chapter title. And then uh, you build out the stories and nest all of these things and they can be dragged around and, and opened up and uh, you can see clearly which template is being used for uh, each, um, each story. Um, I have gather content open in another tab. We can poke around if we have a little bit of time. If you're interested in that. Any questions so far about gather content in this part? Is, is the, uh, so is the color indicating the status of the content? That is fully it is. Fully yeah. Out? Yeah, totally. So um, you can set deadlines on those pieces of content as well. And you'll get a little, you know, uh, the, some columns are hidden here, but it'll tell you when the content is due. You can start to get alerts. Uh, and there are other interfaces that give you a vis visualization of where all the content is at in the, in, the, in, the, in the workflow state. Like, do you have, is 30% in editing, 20% is done, and three, like 10% live on the website. You can also assign content. Yes. And uh, there's also rules for who can move things to different uh, workflow states. Uh, roles. Other questions? All right, so we're building a static site. It's like the good old days, right? It's like Dreamweaver, right? You like cut up your images. You're like slicing and dicing. You're doing all this stuff. Well, now images are responsive, right? You need like a million and a half different images. Uh, hand resizing and coding them all is a pain in the butt, right? So it wasn't a problem, um, it wasn't a huge problem initially, uh, but performance, right? You don't want to be delivering really high resolution images to mobile devices. And if we're putting this, this system in the hands of editors, we're asking them to like Photoshop and crop things and they need to look up all the image sizes and like crop stuff exactly and maybe they get it wrong and it's not going to fit in. It's a nightmare. You gotta like, all the templates would be all like jammed up with like this kind of thing to be able to get all of your, all of your image sizes. So what did we do? We used an API driven image uh, handling solution, similar to how Drupal has this image cache thing. It's like a third party service and it allows you to query, um, to query that, that service. So uh, this was really cool. We chose cloud image for a couple of reasons. One, cloud image lets you perform operations on an image that you can pass via a URL. So as we had the client uploading all their images into gather content, we could then call those images via cloud image and the URL where it lived in gather content and perform op resizing operations on it and deliver it back into the templates. Additionally, they have a JavaScript library which let us write more terse code. Uh, we just finish up. And uh, so that, there's a bunch of configurations where you can set default image sizes at various breakpoints. Uh, and then you can <coughs> use them. Um, so this is what ends up getting rendered out in the browser. Um, for the image, we're just, we're passing these parameters and then based on the breakpoints, it's dynamically 
taking the source and flipping it out uh, to an image. And it's, it's taking these criteria and passing them into the URL parameters to be able to get the images back from uh, cloud image. So the source image, were there any limits on the upload size? You're, like it's on a URL, so what are, you're presumably uploading it at some point. Yes, you want a high resolution image to start with so that you can downsize it to the smallest sizes and, and have it be as, as large as possible. And some of these images, and you can set those limits inside of gather content on, on the images and put help text and recommended resolution uh, in, term, in pixels. Um, and, and there's validation as well. Uh, but um, but but then, then the images are, are in there, uh, and you can call them back. And for some of like the big cover stuff, like it's it's really quite big. So we had different sizes for different different well, uses. I'm talking about the original. The source. Yeah, the original. So you upload that to Gather Content, and Gather Content is configured to. Uh, what's the size limit on the original? Is there a size limit or not? Um, it you know it doesn't matter a ton. I mean, if somebody mm -hmm. who doesn't know, I mean, I don't know. Question. I asked this earlier. Yeah. Uh, people, like some people know about images, some people don't. Mm -hmm. So if you're yeah. uploading images, you have no idea what size it is. It could be you know, mm -hmm. 1600 DPI. And, sure. Know, yeah, it's well. Pixel, regardless of the DPI, it's the number of pixels and and, and that you uh, we're really concerned about, uh, and we want to make sure it's not too small and and not too big. Um, and at the end of the day, our client is sophisticated enough and they have a digital asset management solution. There is a bit of like hand craftiness to this whole thing. We're talking about storytelling experiences. They had a, a like even their content team and content writers knew HTML. And, and so that was a big part weighing uh, into the decision to use gather content and some of these features too, because we knew that they would be able to like um, maintain those standards. Uh, so what are the what are the results look like? Uh, here is a, the URL for the the hub, uh, which you can use to launch out into those uh, those different stories. It is insights.bamsf.org, and uh, here are some examples of the screens on tablet, uh, just for atmospherics. Uh, the work was uh, a Webby honoree uh, this year, which we're very uh, proud of uh, being a part of. And here's um, here's how how it looks. Um, so this is the this is the site. Um, it's in a lot of ways exact or very close or, or adapted to uh, some some of the uh, designs we saw earlier. The initial text that did all that like fadey stuff, we estimated out, and the client was like, eh, "That's not that important. Let's not do it." <laughs> um, but because we had such a transparent process. Uh, with them, we were really able to trade off to get the best product possible and get as close to the designs and the feature set that they were looking to be able to tell uh, this, this story, uh, ultimately. Uh, the, 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 we used uh, Foundation as the, uh, the framework, front-end framework. Does that include the JavaScript? Or? Uh, yes. So we included some parts of the some parts of the foundation uh, bits selectively, uh, as well as additional libraries. Yeah. Yeah, I can. I we can flip over later, and I'll, I can show you all the stuff. Um, so you're you're getting a, a little bit of a, a sense of it. I made this little video uh, side by side. Uh, there's the prototype on the left that they had built in their abstract pieces, and then there's the, the website that we, we put together. Uh, it's mostly the same. Uh, we figured there were additional interactions that needed to happen where people, if they clicked on an existing uh, link, would, would need to get popped back up. And so there was a lot of kind of figuring out how to fill in the gaps um, once it came into that, that level of, of interaction design. Uh, what did we learn? Well, we learned that we have really used uh, Gather Content quite unconventionally. I had an opportunity to chat with the CTO and the CEO of Gather Content uh, about six months ago, uh, and they were like, well, no one's ever done that. Um, we were like, well, we have. Uh, so we're probably, we're trying to work on a bit of a case study with, with them to uh, profitize. 
Um, there was a requirement the client wanted to have, which really given the scope we weren't able to realize. They wanted to have social sharing for different parts of the page. So if you got, it's like one big page, right? You got to this part, you just want to share like one part of the story. You put it on Facebook and come back to that part. Now, all of those tags are in the meta information and they're, you know, um, in a static site, they're not variable. You can't have callbacks to rewrite them. Um, so that, that was something we couldn't do. We could have done that if we had built the site in uh, React, for example, which would have taken more time and energy and was a little bit outside of our wheelhouse at the time. Um, and it, you know, there's, there's some trade-offs as well. We were able to build uh, really quickly and, and onboard the client, uh, and they were able to use tools they were familiar with, with Twig. Uh, they wouldn't have been able to maintain a React application. And, um, but, you know, there's some performance benefits we could have gotten. More, more like dynamic loading of assets and progressive, uh, progressive enhancements, uh, progressive loading. Um, huge props ultimately go to our product owner who was a really big part of, of um, wrapping her head around what we were doing and how we were doing it and, and really trusting us to, to lead them uh, through that, that process and, and follow our advice and that, that, was, that was a huge part of the reason why this project was successful. Uh, but the biggest challenge ultimately was that the lack of an integrated design process made it um, like sometimes we were the bearer of bad news where we had to say, that's great, sure, we can do that. Or we can do that, but it's going to be half your budget. Um, and uh, it, would have been, it would have been nice to, and the client recognized this as well, for us to have built a more like, coherent, comprehensive uh, process altogether. Uh, we just published a case study about this particular project, which uh, highlights some of what I've talked about doesn't go into as much uh, depth in some areas and more in others. You can check it out. And uh, this is a link to Calistatic, which is the open source if you want to play around with it and uh, use it to build whatever. Uh, it has some documentation as well. And thank you. This is me again. And questions, thoughts, feelings. Does Calistatic, it uses Twig? It can. Now it's a framework uh, which uses certain conventions. As such, you can flip it out for different templating language. You can, uh, and, and different rendering engines as well. So we uh, use uh, Metalsmith as our generator, but um, you know, you could, uh, we use this thing called uh, JS Transformer. So it detects the file extensions. If you were to throw it uh, instead of a Twig, a uh, Jekyll, uh, you know, it can, it can handle that. It's just a bit of light configuration and it does some auto de detection. So it's a lot of versatility in how you, can, um, how you can use it. And it's all the same thing. It's not like you need to download the PHP version of Pattern Lab or the whatever, you know, which I don't know what their, how many versions they have now. Metalsmith is what, uh, what language? Uh, so Metalsmith is the static site generator. It was developed by a company called Segment in San Francisco. Uh, they still maintain it. They've moved their site over to Gatsby uh, at this point, I believe. And so it's in the Node ecosystem? It is. All of uh, Calistatic is, uh, the only dependency is Node. Okay. And uh, you NPM install everything and it, it pulls it all together. Do you happen to have any Docker containers? Or? Uh, Docker containers aren't necessary because um, you know, all you need to do is install Node, and sure. that's something you may want to be configuring on your system okay. in, in the way that you want to. We, we had considered it. Uh, if you are interested in Docker-type containers, you can uh, check out Lando, which is the successor to uh, Calibox, another uh, product which we developed. You developed Lando? Uh, we developed Cal Calibox. Lando is uh, Calibox 4, Okay. Uh, and uh, Calamuna, um, uh, spun uh, Calibox out to be more focused on uh, its success as a prod as a product, and uh, the the um, so the the other founders of Calamuna have uh, continued on to work on that, and which they have renamed uh, as okay. Lando. 
Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's excellent. We, we use it uh, internally, and uh, well, many other people do. Probably heard of it. Other questions? Yes. Um, how, like you said, you use uh, Gatacana in a very specific way for your site. Mm -hmm. um, would you recommend Gatacana for other uh, usage? Right. It would like versus building a, a site in Drupal where you own this content versus paying a third party to post that content. Mm -hmm. um, what's your cost benefit analysis between using that or Drupal? Well, uh, the benefit here is that we can get started er early and independently of the CMS existing on the content creation process. It's a it's a design tool uh, for designing content and validating content, and as such, we'll create a better product. So you can look at it as an investment that will get something better out the other side. Um, a lot of people look at it that way and then they ditch gather content when the, once the site exists and people put their content inside the CMS. That's what gather content has mostly been used for. You gather it, you organize it, you figure it out, you throw some stuff around and then you're like, boom, there it is, then you suck it in and then you keep editing it in the CMS. The pipeline is usually broken at that point. Mm -hmm. So that's how it would differ from, say, content uh, where you would. That's uh, content uh, what is it called? Contentful. Contentful. Yeah. contentful. Yeah. Yes. So contentful is uh, is also API driven. They have a slightly different model. It's also it was also more expensive uh, for for our purposes. Um, they calculate their pricing is based on number of pieces of content. And uh, so we evaluated that kind of like the scalability of how much content there would be over time. And uh, there's a, you know, in the roadmap, we can decommission parts of the stories that are then published and they don't count towards your quota anymore. So you could, you know, it would kind of break on the build now. So we'd have to do a little bit more to, um, to make it work to say, oh, this one has moved to stop, stop getting the stuff from gather content for this story. It's, it's like dead and then you know you can resurrect it later to do updates. So that's a, a way that you could, you know, in this case, use that model. But if you were to have a website, uh, use it for all the content of your website and you had hundreds of thousands of nodes, it would be rather expensive, um, particularly because not all the pieces of contents are like a node. They might be broken up into all these little bits and that's what, uh, what proliferates. But something we really do like about it too is it's got this shared model. You can have lots of projects in it. It's not a cost per project. So we can bring our clients into this and use the tool and it does, as an agency, it doesn't cost us like an arm and a leg for every project. It's like a great value add for the clients to get to use another tool and we don't even charge them for it and it enhances their project and their process. And they can use this kind of thing and this workflow for other stuff that they're authoring, any kind of document, something that's not going online for marketing materials, for, for whatever it is. Um, and creating the fields and the content types is fairly intuitive. It doesn't require a computer science degree or, or any like real technical uh, knowledge. Of course, the technical background is important because as you make decisions, they have implications uh, from a data modeling perspective and maintenance perspective. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's um, we've been we've been really uh, happy with it uh, so far in the right context. If you were to uh, actually, sorry, uh, do you still have your question? I think you had your hand. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, how does so? I was quite interested to see this tree status of content uh, readiness, mm -hmm. and does that handle revisions? So if, if you revision um, you know, a very complex landing page and you're preparing the next revision and yes. four or five things within that page need to be revised yes. as well as... Yeah. It does handle revisions, uh, but that's another tier. So we didn't um, go f for that tier um, and, and really like the sort of workflow states are uh, what are being what are being used. So the, the revisions are not active in this account, but you can pay more to get active revisions and uh, all kinds of more like in commenting and user workflow stuff. Comment you can comment on the content and stuff. Like Google Docs or whatever. If uh, if you were to 
you know, face a similar project with the Drupal ecosystem as it is right now. Yeah. So robust paragraphs, landscape, and then potentially a layout builder, mm -hmm. uh, you know, could be could be uh, at play. Do you think you'd end up coming to the same choice, or the client, you know, the client in a similar circumstance would end up coming to the same choice if you didn't have such time pressure to hit that first launch? Uh, if we didn't have the same time pressures, we, we might have been looking, we probably would have been looking at more of a React-based solution. Um, and at the time, um, Gatsby was not uh, as mature as it is right now. It, it's still maturing as well. Um, but if we had to do it today, I would, we would pro likely try to do it in Gatsby. It's, got, it's a great uh, use case for this particular kind of single page app and, and the performance that is uh, really required from it. And it has a, an API uh, centric view. Um, I don't know if it has a gather content, uh, built in gather content integration in the ecosystem, but um, that's something that we could have uh, built out. It was something we evaluated in the different solutions uh, that we um, were, were looking at. We had some proof of concepts we had already built integrations with in, in Calistatic. Um, and uh, this was was kind of up there. Yes, sir. Um, so, in terms of costs and sort of like the legacy uh, or the technical debt of mm -hmm. the choices, I guess. Um, like, how does the balance work out? I mean, you're you're not hosting any of this or maintaining. It's all on Netlify. Yes. And Netlify's this is a production website for one of the largest museums in North America, and they don't pay a dollar for hosting. They don't pay, you don't, they don't have to pay for the Netflix. Why is that? Is that uh, Their free tier or? is very generous. Pardon me? Their free tier is very generous. Okay. And we're not making like, it's a single page app. It's all like one right. app. Like people go and they, they look at a thing. Mm -hmm. They're not looking at like 400 things. Right. So from a, the way that they calculate, um, yeah, yeah. They're, they are paying for cloud image. Yeah, is that expensive? It depends on, on how you use it. Um, the, the, the one way of cutting costs, which we explored, which you know is a trade-off, is like, well, we could build it so that you get the, you get the images, and then we hope we do all the resizing, and then we hold on to them locally, and then use those, so we're not going out and requesting them all the time. Sure. Um, but the price the pricing model was uh, was pretty good, so it was cheaper to pay them than to pay us to build that functionality. Uh, and the, the so and Netlify being free, it was like kind of a no-brainer. But it did add additional costs because their legacy stories remained on Drupal 8 untouched, and they continue to be hosted. And there's a cost to that. Okay. They did not uh, bring over the legacy stories into the new model, and there that was the intent from the beginning of the project. So the bottom line though is that this was probably like very affordable. I'm guessing for like I mean like in terms of hosting maintenance. And so on going forward, this seems like it would be substantially less expensive than a lot of options. Oh yeah, for hosting, you've got some small stuff. You want to put it up there. Like Netlify is is, is super great if you don't need like dynamic uh, a lot of dynamic content. Um, it works really great. Their APIs are smooth. It's it's pretty quick, and they have a build system. And so we're through their build system. We're compiling our SaaS, and we're you know pushing all that stuff up. We're not pushing any CSS up to GitHub. Uh, Netlify is doing all of that uh, in the build, get, getting all the stuff from gather content, parsing that, and then shooting it up uh, to the to the interwebs. And it, it has this integration with GitHub, which is great. So you make a pull request, pull request, you get a new environment in Netlify, you can go see it just about right away. So you do your, Q, well, you do your QA process the same way, basically? Yeah, I mean, we had a targeted environment on test a test environment, and uh, it's here. Yeah, test at dash that dash fantasy insights and so they could go there reliably, and we would merge merge the test, and that would that mirrors essentially the the workflow states of gather content. So whenever anything was like the con all the content that's in test is on test, and the new content doesn't get built out in that environment. So you're only seeing the newest content based on the workflow states. I think we're out of time. Thank you. But I appreciate all these. Thank you. It was great. Great questions. Love to chat more.